the is carcinoma of unknown primary it's a very varied entity it includes a pre presentation of malignancy with the unknown lymph node with the or some specific metastasis from where the secondary malignancy is diagnosed and according to the diagnosis you have to proceed to know what where, where the primary is so the definition by definition carcinoma of unknown primary is called when a biopsy proven malignancy but without any identified primary site of origin despite comprehensive evaluation the basic investigation has been done and no particular primary site has been found but there is a metastatic site like a lymph node or a peritoneum or something like that so at that condition we can call as a carcinoma of unknown primary so the incidence is very varying incidence overall it is around 2% of all the malignancies and uh, the overall survival history historically was very bad it was uh, below a year usual overall survival is usually below a year but uh, with new targeted uh, diagnostic with updated immunohistochemistries and other tests the more and more primary has been recognized and if this primary has been treated in a targeted approach so the newer overall survival has little bit improved so what should be the initial evaluation for a carcinoma of unknown primary so if we find somewhere carcin in a carcinoma of in unknown primary like a inguinal node or a cervical node or something like a omental deposit without any primary source so what we should do we should take a biopsy from that so the histopathology is the first step to evaluate before proceeding for other investigation so if we clinically suspect that it is a malignant lesion like a malignant node or a omentum infiltration we should get the histopathology either by a biopsy or a diagnostic laparoscopy or whatever it is and we should stain the edge path uh, with a particular ihc to divide the lineages of the cell so what are the usual lineages of cell the basic lineage are a carcinoma it can be a lymphoma it can be a melanoma or it can be a sarcomatous lineage or very rarely it can be like very small blue tumors like neuroendocrine tumor type of small round blue tumors so these are the usual broad lines what we get from the histopathology of the metastatic site and basic after running the basic ids and among the carcinoma as you all know it can be a adenocarcinoma which is the most common one around 70% or we can call it as a adenocarcinoma with a known primary it can be a poorly differentiated carcinoma where you cannot really differentiate between whether it is a adeno or a squamous like that that is a very common scenario so this is around 20 to 25% can be a squamous cell carcinoma also that uh, comprises almost 5% of the unknown primary of the if we consider the whole of the body but if we consider the neck nodes with unknown primary squamous cell carcinoma is the most common histology so for neck node of a metastasis of unknown origin of a neck node is 95% cases it is squamous cell carcinoma only 5% cases it is a adenocarcinoma but if we come see whole of the body the adenocarcinoma is much more common than as squamous cell carcinoma so having keeping this diagnosis in mind we should know what are the basic ihc test am i audible to all yes sir okay so keeping in mind this differential diagnosis we should proceed for to know what are the basic immunohistochemistry we should have to differentiate between this all lineages so the first basic immunohistochemistry what usually is done is the pan cytokeratin 
तो पैनसाइटोक्रेटिन इज ए मार्कर ऑफ ए कार्सिनोमा केराटिन इज एन इंटरमीडिएट फिलामेंट सो इफ देयर इज पैनसाइटोक्रेटिन पॉजिटिविटी दैट मे इंडिकेट दैट यू आर डीलिंग विद ए कार्सिनोमा नॉट ए सार्कोमा लिम्फोमा सो अलोंग विद दैट यू विल रन अ सीडी 45 व्हिच इज ए यूनिवर्सल लिम्फोमा मार्कर सो दैट विल डिफरेंशिएट बिटवीन इफ यू आर डीलिंग विद ए लिम्फोमा the if the melanoma markers like s100 are positive then it can be a cancer in a melanoma lineage or if it is some neuroendocrine marker like chromogranin or synaptopsin positive so that can be a neuroendocrine tumor so this is the basic ihc which we do to differentiate between the initial lineage of cells whether it is a carcinoma lymphoma melanoma and along with that we run vimentin for sarcoma so sarcoma will be vimentin positive and rest of things will be negative so if we get a clean cut diagnosis like a or one particular marker is positive and rest of negative so we can land up in a straight forward diagnosis but many time what happens that one or two marker may be positive or one marker can be intermediate to stained because it is all depend on the intensity of the staining immunohistochemistry is a nothing but a special stains so it all positivity and negativity depends on the intensity of the stain so in many a case it can be a intermediate staining so it can be a plus minus thing so it can be a poorly differentiated one that can express many of this ihc lineages so that can confuse our diagnosis so if we get a get a straight cut diagnosis from this five markers so you can go straight ahead with the diagnosis and then we can do the specific ihc on that particular lineage but if you can't get a particular diagnosis or particular conclusive evidence from this ihc suppose two one or two are positive or all of them are negative suppose like that scenario then in that, that case we need to do some additional investigations so having said that uh, i'll uh, say something about the keratin the pancytokeratin as i have told keratin is a this is a basic most common ihc marker for any carcinoma so keratin is a intermediate filament protein which is expressed on the epithelial cells from that the carcinoma arises as you all know carcinoma arises from the epithelial cells but having said that there are some other cancers which can also express keratin in some extent like mesothelioma and some sarcoma also expresses keratin so it is not a 100% thing as you all know in medical sense there is nothing mm -hmm. is straight forward so some sarcomas and some mesotheliomas also expresses cytokeratin or keratin along with carcinoma so that can confuse the diagnosis a bit extent now <clears throat> in this keratin so cytokeratins so there are some specific cytokeratins which you usually test to differentiate between a different lineage of carcinoma like uh, your squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma or particular primary site so these are ck7 ck20 these two are very important markers that can differentiate between the origin of the cancers depending on the origin of the organ this all uh, expression of the ck7 and ck20 changes so if we find so if we find that both ck7 and ck20 is positive then the primary of carcinoma the origin of carcinoma most probably from a breast or pulmonary or it can be a tube ovarian like ovary or endometrium or it can be a thyroid cancer so these are the usual primary when we find both ck7 and ck20 positivity in a carcinoma so <coughs> no but if we find a ck7 positive in ihc but ck um, sorry 
the uh, if it is a ck7 positive and ck20 negative then the sources can be a breast pulmonary tube ovarian or a thyroid but having said that this finding ck7 positivity and ck20 negativity this is not very specific because that encompasses many of the organ like breast lung or uh, gynecological organ so this is very non specific so if it is ck7 positive or ck negative then you can think of carcinoma originating from this organs but it is not very specific but if we get the other finding like ck7 positive and ck20 positive that is very specific for upper gi tumors like your gastroesophageal tumors pancreatic tumors or urothelial tumors now if you have ck7 positive sorry ck7 negative and ck20 positive is usually a colorectal cancer or very rarely it can be a, if it is a soft tissue tumor it can be a merkel cell carcinoma and if both of them are negative it can be a prostate hepatic cellular carcinoma or a adrenal cortical carcinoma so just keep in mind among these two findings the ck7 positive and ck20 negative and ck27 negative and ck20 positive because most of the time this diagnosis helps us to differentiate between a peritoneal carcinomatosis whether the origin is colorectal or whether the origin is ovarian so in that case Uh, most of if it is a ovarian origin most of the times it is a ck7 positive and ck20 negative if it is a colorectal one it will be a ck7 negative and ck20 positive rest of things also guide us to the inclination towards a particular organ but those are not always very specific so this is a preliminary cytokeratin which we run for adenocarcinomas usually of unknown origin Now suppose we have a squamous cell carcinoma, and if we are, or we have a poorly differentiated carcinoma, we can go for CK5 or 6. These are called high molecular cytokeratins, or a P63 in the immunohistochemistry. If among any of them are positive, that suggests that it can be a squamous cell carcinoma. So with the help of this cytokeratin 7, 20, 5, and 6. and with the help of p63 we can differentiate between the type of carcinoma and suspicious that we can predict the organ of origin and according to that we can channelize or further investigation suppose if you have a ck7 positive and ck positive and ck56 negative from a poorly differentiated carcinoma of a neck node so it can suggest that it can be upper gi so we can go ahead with upper gi endoscopy or a very yeah, urothelial carcinoma so if we get a upper gi endoscopy negative we can go for a you know, cystoscopy and ure <coughs> urothelial cell evaluate tract evaluation so that is how we proceed from a basic biopsy to the immunohistochemistry but after all this extensive assays it is very though it sometimes it's very helpful it is a direct answer to the primary but most of the times it's very confusing because it's very overlapping some markers will come positive and uh, more than one specific marker will come positive and that that scenario it can be get confused it is more confused on the cases of poorly differentiated carcinoma so there are some limitations of isc so these limitations have to be keep in mind first that the diagnostic accuracy is not perfect as i have said that cytokeratin can be positive for a mesothelioma or a some sarcomas or <coughs> excuse me uh, anaplastic carcinomas can be or poorly differentiated carcinoma can be cytokeratin negative there can be inter or inter intra observer variation because it all depends on the intensity of the staining so that can vary the positivity and negativity can vary according to the observer to some extent d differentiation of tumor is a quite known feature 
So if the tumor get de differentiated, so the basic IC markers are lost. If a carcinoma get de differentiated into a sarcoma, so the carcinomatous marker will be lost. And there can be a heterogeneous tumor, like some part of the tumor that is comprises of a carcinoma and some other part that has differentiated in a poor, poorly differentiated manner. So that can, if your biopsy is from that poorly differentiated part, it can yield some negative results. So this are the limitations of IHC. And another one is many, many malignancies have a same basic IHC. So you cannot basically differentiate between a, a ovarian versus the uh, endometrial origin from a IHC. We cannot differentiate with stomach or small intestinal origin. Some cancers have overlapping IHC. It's not that specific every organ wise. So usually what we suggest is don't go for extensive IC because pathologists sometimes keen for a diagnosis and then go for running different IC for different organ which among which the primary is suspicious. So the usual advice is don't rush more than 10 to 12 IC because this is a very uh, costly and time taking investigation. So if we just getting uh, lose your time for diagnosis on getting this IC report because each of the marker will take some time to develop. So that will delay, hamper the diagnosis of this cancer in this patient. So usually after 10 to 12 IC, we usually plan to know now, pathologically we cannot diagnose the primary. Now we should go for the another result we have by which we can predict the primary. So if your IC is got exhausted after this 10, 12 IC and there is no still no specific uh, answer to your carcinoma of unknown primary. There is no primary till now. So you should go ahead with the step two or you should proceed with other investigations. So what are the other investigations? You can go ahead with a gene expression based testing. Or this is called molecular tumor profiling NTP. So what they will do, you will study the mutations uh, in different way of particular uh, metastasis you have found or particular uh, secondary you have found. So you will try to see the mutations, you try to see the genomic gene expressions and according to that, you will try to predict the organ of origin of the primary tumor. So there are three types of uh, gene expression profiling that is available right now. One is called tissue of origin. Or this is also called a cancer genetics. This is basically a RNA expression based genomic profiling. The second one is a cancer type ID. So this is basically RT-PCR assay based on nine to two genes. The third one is the cancer origin. These are particular name for the particular product we have available in market. So this is a basically micro RNA based analysis. So all this helps to see the mutations, what the mutations we have in the particular secondary cancer. And according to the mutation, if suppose it is a keras mutation or in this mutation. So that will suggest that it might be a origin from the colorectal tissue. If it can diagnose uh, ALK or ROS mutation, which is very common in lung cancers, it can suggest that the primary can be a lung. The overall accuracy is around 70 to 85% of all these tests. So this is our second Arm <clears throat> instrument in our armamentarium, which we have when we don't have any clue for primary after extensive radiological and 
other investigations, high extensive IHC. So, other than this, if we don't get something also from this genetic genome molecular tumor profiling also, then again, we have to shift our uh, diagnosis to some further IHC. So, these are called step three or additional IHCs. The list is very exhaustive. I'll just give you some particular important one which can help you to understand whether the, these IC are most more costly and more time consuming than the previous easy or cytokeratins and basic IC. So there is PAX8, which is very common in RCC and thyroid. Also in gynecological cancers, ovary and natrium. Another marker is the TTF1, which is very important marker for lung adenosia. And also thyroid cancers will express this TTF1. The third marker is the napsine. The very important for lung identity again. Over the entire cell CA. Then it can be a CGX2 that is very specific for your colorectal malignancies. And then it can be your thyroglobulin, that is the marker of differential thyroid cancer. We have some marker for hepatocellular carcinoma. If from some clinic background, you are just hepatocellular carcinoma, you can go for arginase 1 or hepar 1. These are marker of HCC, specific marker for HCC. Other than this, if you are, it is a female patient and you are dealing with the unknown axillary node or a cervical node, if you have breast cancer in your mind, then ERPR is a IC, heart is a IC to be done. But keep, having, keep in mind that ERPR also expressed in endometrial CA, ovarian sterile CA. So breast CA is a fast diagnosis. Here we are also expressed in these other cancers. So these are, there are a very long list. I've just mentioned a few because these are additional IC. This usually we don't do primarily. Once we're very sure about the lineage, suppose it is a carcinoma, a particular carcinoma or a renal cell carcinoma suspecting a particular metastasis type like a hypervascular metastasis. So it can be a renal cell carcinoma or a thyroid malignancy. Then at that particular suspicion, we can run the this particular IC2 from this specimen, though that can guide us to the diagnosis. So the last result we have, if we don't have any radiological proof and all these steps have misleaded us, is to identification of a direct mutation, which is amenable to targeted therapy. So after all these exhaustive investigations, if we don't find anything, then the diagnosis, you cannot diagnose the exact primary. So what you will try, you will leave the idea of diagnosis and you will try to get the mutations which are targetable. Means against which, the, which mutations you have some systemic therapies through which you can actually treat the patient. So the basically this fourth step is in next generation sequencing, NGS panel. So if we can find some targetable mutation, like if it is a Keras and thus mutation, or you can have ALK or ROS mutation. In that case, you have some targetable drugs. So, uh, that targetable drugs you can use, like say, you can have these are the drug, drug again. Like, suppose you found a VEGF mutation, you can target for Bivacizumab. So the final idea is to leave the idea of diagnosis. So you are 
and try to identify a particular mutation which is uh, targeted by which can be targeted by immunotherapy so you identify that particular mutation and give this immunotherapy which will act systematically to the primary as well as the metastasis so that may improve the outcome of this patient because overall the metastasis of unknown origin the survival is usually less than a year so if we lose our time in diagnosis in this very uh, advanced malignancy that will not suffice so after some time we'll leave the idea of diagnosis and try to treat the patient to some extent with the help of this immunotherapy so this is the basically uh, format of the proce how to proceed for a real carcinoma of unknown primary uh, which is defined as a historically proven malignancy without any evidence of primary after comprehensive investigation that means you have done all the ct scan your pet scan and all this radiological investigation clinical investigation and after that also you cannot look at the primary endoscopy is another things so in that cases we'll try to proceed with the histopathology followed by your basic ilc if the basic ilc does not lead us to somewhere then we can go ahead with some molecular tumor profiling which are available in market two or three types if that also mistaking we can do some additional ilc which are costly and very not available everywhere and then at all if we cannot diagnose anything we have to resort on identifying the targetable mutation with the help of ngs panel or next generation sequencing panel and try to give some systemic immunotherapies against this actionable mutation which can treat to some extent the primary and the secondary tumor so having described all of this uh, particular things about this ilc and genetic uh, evaluation uh, this molecular tumor profiling i'll go to some extent about the what are the if we find a clinically uh, metastasis of unknown primary where so what should be your approach how you should proceed to identify them so what will be the evaluate how can you clinically evaluate the positive carcinoma of unknown primary so keep in mind that uh most of the autopsy series has shown that most of the carcinoma of unknown primary with the patient has died ultimately found 27% cases it is lung pancreas and hepatobiliary or biliary system it is around 32% kidney adrenal is around 7% and colorectum is around person this is a basic autopsy this is from an autopsy series in which the patient has died and diagnosed and after that um, the, they have performed the autopsy in this patient and found the uh, statistics key which are the common cancers to present as a carcinoma of unknown primary so the usual symptoms of carcinoma of unknown primary other than the prime and the secondary node or metastasis is your constitutional symptom which is very common so it can be fatigue anorexia weight loss ascites may be so as i have said the diagnostic approach after you have done the clinical examination you excluded all the lymphadenopathy you check for the other lymphadenopathy is like you find the cervical lymph node you look for mainly mostly the primary in the head neck you will see the oral cavity oropharynx hypopharynx larynx you see the nasopharynx you check for lymphadenopathy of the other sites whether to it is a uh, possible to exclude the possibility of lymphoma now also you'll see for the abdomen to so whether it is a which or sign whether there is a metastatic <coughs> lymph node from the metastatic cancer from the abdomen so the clinical it will do a comprehensive clinical examination you should examine every Uh, female carcinoma of unknown primary for breast and gynecological examination should be done in males every cases test should be examined which are the hidden species which you usually don't examine or leave every patient should be do a, done a parietal examination to so you will examine the patient comprehensive in a comprehensive way and after that obviously we will start your diagnosis with histopathology and uh, 
your ISC and other things which I have discussed. Along with that, um, what you will do, you will try to map the timeline of the symptom. So this is very important because uh, sometimes if we see that if there is a symptom like uh, uh, a particular pre-existing symptom sometimes and uh, that help us to lead to the diagnosis. Like if you have a patient of uh, suppose a, a carcinoma gallbladder in your mind because the patient can give her give a history of a advanced polycystic with complicated polycystic outside. Uh, so the timeline is very important because how fast the tumor is going from the onset up to the presentation to the clinician that will lead us to a suspicion of the malignancy uh, type of malignancy we keep in mind. Suppose if it is a very fast going to multiple the patient is having some initial anorexia and dyspepsia followed by developed axillary lymph node within 15 days so what we'll think we'll think of a aggressive malignancy but if we find a neck node which is persisting from very long time like uh, three months or six months then our clinical suspicion will be towards a comparatively low slow growing malignancy like the thyroid or something like that so Timeline of diagnosis is very important. Along with that, the past history or past history of any surgery or any lesion that has vanished, like which is very common in melanoma, the primary sometimes get vanished. So this should be asked. In a, in a, so, or it can be some lesion which has been operated previously. Suppose the patient is giving a history of excision of a breast lump one year back. Now he's, she's presenting with a cervical lymph node. So it will <clears throat> incline your diagnosis towards a breast cancer mode. So these are uh, all this, you have to correlate the symptoms, the timeline of the onset and how fast that your symptoms are growing. Along with that, you have to take the help of your ISC and other particular uh, your tumor profiling to get the diagnosis. Uh, in every case, you should do some basic investigation that can help you in diagnosis like CBC, LFT, RFT, your electrolytes, including calciums, LDH, stool local blood test. So these are very, very easy investigation. This is can be or PSA in case of man. So these are very available over the counter. But with this pictures, you can suppose you can have some. Uh, uh, clue to the diagnosis like if you have a very low hemoglobin or uh, you can suspect some ongoing bleeding a cancer which is uh, bleeding is occult bleeding is going on and that time you can if the stool which comes positive that can incline your diagnosis towards a colorectal or a GI malignancy if your calcium is very high so it can incline towards some uh, <clears throat> malignancy where osteolysis is there so this way, LDH, if it is very high, it can suggest some rapidly dividing tumor like lymphoma or other things. So this basic investigation you can do in every patient when you have no clue from the primary, it might help you to get the diagnosis. And then once it's blood tested, then you should go for imaging based on the location of the secondary tumor or the location of the unknown primary tumor, uh, this COP. So if you have inguinal node, it is better to go for a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. If you have a cervical node, you should go ahead first with a CT scan of head, neck and thorax. If you have an axillary node, you can go for a CT scan of thorax and neck. So according to the location, you will plan your imaging first. And then if it is a female patient uh, and there is a neck or axillary lymph node and you have not found the primary, you can go for a mammogram so female axilla or neck you can go ahead with the mammogram and if the mammogram is inconclusive you can do for a breast MRI if it is inguinal node you go and do the extensive investigation uh, examination of the genitalia 
anal canal and everything and then you go towards the CCT of the abdomen pelvis which is a retroperitoneal or mediastinal node The discussion can anybody prompt me where we have left the discussion? Hello, sir. Retro peritoneal node GCT, sir. So, so, so according to our pattern of metastasis, we know common pattern of metastasis, we should plan our radiological investigations. Like if you have a female with the axillary or neck node and you cannot line up in a diagnosis, you can plan your uh, mammogram and breast MRI accordingly. If it is a retroperitoneal mediastinal lymphadenopathy and you are uh, finding no other primaries in lung and earth, abdomen, you can go ahead with the testicular ultrasound to see for the germ cell tumors. Similarly, if it is an inguinal node and after extensive examination of the lower limb, anal canal, your genitourinary system, there is no finding, you can go ahead with the CECT abdomen and pelvis. So these are the most, so to locate the most common primaries is the target, or the most common. So you have to plan your radiological investigation according to this, that. Now the question is sometimes uh, what is asked is can we do a PET CT because it is a whole body scan. So can PET CT replace this radiological investigation or this it can replace this IHCs so our diagnosis become easier. The answer is it is uh, it is not very effective to know the primary overall. It is only 24 to 40% cases the primary can be exactly known by the help of PET CT because both primary and the metastatic site also become PET uptake. So it is not useful to differentiate between the primary and the secondary site. And it is not routinely, uh, it is not recommended blanketly for every cases of metastasis of unknown origin. But having said that, it has some particular indications where it should be done in a routine basis, like if it is a squamous cell carcinoma metastasis to the neck node, which is very sensitive to PET, the usually more than 50% cases can be diagnosed with the help of PET CT in that particular scenario. Uh, after PET CT comes the roles of tumor marker like CA99, CAA, CA153 or CA125. So though this tumor markers helps to uh, predict the organ of, you know, of malignancy, but uh, it is should not be used uh, blanketly, and uh, it is it should be done selectively when you suspect a particular primary site. Suppose you are suspecting a GI tumors, so you can go ahead with a CA or C99. If you are suspecting a, you have found some osteoblastic. Uh, bone mates and in an aged patient, you can go ahead with the PSA. If you're suspecting um, dealing with a massive ascites with peritoneal deposits, so you go ahead with the CA1 deposit. So your clinical suspicion should be in the mind for the primary. So when you're suspect malignancy with massive ascites and peritoneal deposits, advanced epithelial ovarian tumors, you can go ahead with the CA125. If you're suspecting some GI tumors, you can go ahead with this marker, but these all markers should not be used blanketly. And if you're suspecting a uh, germ cell tumor, suppose a retroperitoneal tumors and other things, you can go ahead with this AP, beta HCG, and alpha beta protein A or uh, LDH. So these are like, you have to first look for or 
plan for uh, some uh, particular diagnosis, then only the tumor markers will be helpful. Just doing blanketly all the tumor markers is not a way suggested for a diagnosis of a unknown primary. So now what should be the focused evaluation in a particular subgroups? Suppose there are some subgroups which are also called favorable subgroups. So I'll come on discussion regarding this. So first is a squamous cell carcinoma or MEO neck with cervical or supraclavicular. So this is a very common situation uh, presenting with a neck node which come out to be a squamous cell carcinoma but there is no known primary on your in a oral examination in laryngoscopy on the pharynx larynx or in the CT scan. So in that cases, you have to do extensive investigation examination under anesthesia of this all uh, sites. And if all the clinical and radiological or uh, your finding are negative, we should go ahead. Right, okay. PET CT scan, as I have said, PET CT is specially indicated in this situation. And now, if we have some particular suspicious sites in the PET CT, we can have some targeted biopsy. Or if we don't have a particular PET CT negative uptake, no uptake of the PET CT, we can go some blind biopsy. On the usual hidden side like fossa frozen molar valicular etc. Other than this, we can do go for a EVB testing, which may suggest our primary as a nasopharynx, or we can see the P16 ISC from the tumor, which can suggest a HPV infection, which will suggest a primary in the oropharynx. Because this HPV infection is very common in oropharyngeal cancers, and the EVV infection is very common in the southern eastern Asia in the nasopharyngeal cancers. So, after all this, if all these things are negative, we can go ahead with ipsilateral or bilateral tonsillectomy. And even after all this, if the diagnosis is still unknown, we can go ahead with the if the node is small, we can go ahead with the surgery followed by radiation therapy. And if it is a large node, we can go ahead with a chemo radiation. So, but the overall prognosis of this uh, squamous cell carcinoma of unknown origin of neck node is usually good. Even if we have not diagnosis, diagnosed the primary site with the help of the surgery or radiation or this chemo mucosal radiation or chemo radiation, the survival is usually good. It is in two, three years or five years. And sometimes the primary manifest in a later stage and that can also be targeted later on. So this is one of the particular favorable condition or favorable site you can call where carcinoma is unknown primary is not that bad. The second one is a squamous cell carcinoma of inguinal node. So how do you approach a squamous cell carcinoma of the inguinal node? So if you have to examine carefully the anal canal, vulva, vagina, cervix, and if in case of male, penis and scrotum, all the genital urinary organs should be examined very well. And if you don't find anything in this, uh, region, any particular lesion, so you should go ahead with the CCT of the pelvis. Because many of the time, it can be some pelvic organ uh, which has metastasis to the particular node, inguinal node. And these are also HPV-related infection. So there is a role of P16 testing, P16 ISC, and this coming up. Though it is not yet established as a neck cervical metastasis, but it is coming up because most of this cancer also are HPV related. Now, if we have a third condition is if you have a neuroendocrine tumor. So if we find in a biopsy, it is small blue round cell tumor 
and it is CK seven twenty plus minus but cyanoptomycin positive, chromogran positive. So what you will do? You will grade the tumor. Suppose you have found a any key from a cervical lymph node or a axillary lymph node, you will grade with the help of your mitosis and the marker called as KI67. So it can be a low grade or it can be a high grade. So if it is a low grade, what you will do? You will do a octotrite scan or a pet dota tet. These are functional scan, nuclear imaging. Rather than doing this CT extensive CT scan and MRI, which will be most of the time, because the primary of the neuroendocrine tumor, most of the time are very small. And if it is a low grade, the chances of primary in the GI tract is very high, upper GI or lower GI. So you can go directly go ahead with this functional whole body scan that will help to diagnose early the particular primary lesion. Along with that, you can go ahead with the upper GI or a colonoscopy. Or you can go for the urine or serum chromogranin A. So this will help to diagnose the this endocrine tumors, your carcinoid tumors, glucagonoma, VIPMOs of the GI tract because most of these low grade tumors are associated with GI malignant, GI neuroendocrine tumors. If it is a high grade, the KI67 is very high, the mitosis rate is very high. So there is a chance that this is a very bad malignancy and most of the time this is located in a lung, bronchial carcinoid. So you will see for the history of smoking, you can go ahead with the bronchoscopy. And if you want to do a scan, it is better to go for a PET CT scan rather than doing this dota tate or octotrite scan because poorly differentiated high grade tumors are usually very pet avid. So that will help you to diagnose the your primary site. And most of the time, this high grade neuroendocrines are usually from lung. Now, the fourth situation is, am I clear for this neuroendocrine tumor story? Because this is a very, one of the very blessed tumors of when you are dealing with a carcinoma of unknown primary. If you get a metastasis of a neuroendocrine tumor, that's still the situation can be a curable one or a, like a germ cell tumor. So uh, you should know the grading of the neuroendocrine tumor. And according to the grade, you should plan your functional imaging. If it is a low grade, you can go ahead with a PET dota tate or octotrite scan. If it's a high grade, go for a PET CT and plan your scopies accordingly. If it is a low grade, you, the most of the sources are GI sources. So go for colonel or an upper GI. If it is a high grade, chance of bronchial carcinoma is very high, go for a bronchoscopy. Now, the fourth situation is a woman with a axillary lymph node or with a metastasis to bone, lungs or liver. So woman with axillary node or lung, bone meds, medialogy domain. So this suggests the possibility of underlying breast cancer, obviously. So what you have to do, you have to give check for this CK, and if it is CK7 positive usually, go for a mammography. If the mammography is inconclusive, don't leave the patient, do a breast MRI. If you are still have a suspicion of mind, you can go ahead with the ERPR testing from the biopsy. Other markers can be GCTFP5, tritine, data 3. These are also breast cancer specific marker or you can do for a test for the heart tumor. So these are usually markers of a breast cancer when you are dealing with a situation where breast cancer is a possibility. These are the investigation you can do and if it if the diagnosis comes as a breast cancer, the situation is a comparatively a better prognosis. It's a blessing because 
even if metastatic breast cancer, if it is ERP or positive cancer, the prognosis can be good, still good. The fifth situation is when we are dealing with a woman with the possible features of a metastatic ovarian cancer like pelvic or peritoneal metastasis, ascites, huge ascites, Uh, without any particular tube ovarian ovarian mass. So this is a situation which is called mimics the ovarian cancer. So also call it primary peritoneal malignancy because the tumor in this uh, malignancy arises from the peritoneal surface of the uh, fallopian tube. So what you'll do, you'll do extensive pelvic examination to rule out your um, occult ovarian tumor or yeah, uterine endometrial tumor, well, you can take the help of pelvic ultrasound and you will check for the particular markers for ovarian tumor like WT1, PAC state, ERP. So these tumors may, this also your CKs will help to incline your diagnosis. So if you have this ascites fluid cytoblock in hand or a mental biopsy or a peritoneal biopsy in hand, from that, if the situation is a woman with this extensive peritoneal primary med, you will keep the diagnosis of your ovary and the advanced epithelial ovary cancer in mind and do this comprehensive administration. And if it is a uh, comes out to be a primary peritoneal malignancy or a ovary cancer with the occult primary, you can still go ahead with the curative cytoreductive surgery with this huge amount of ascites and uh, peritoneal deposits, you can just drain the ascites, do a amontectomy, do a hysterectomy, bilateral cerebrofemoprotomy, do a complete peritonectomy. And you can still add your intraperitoneal chemotherapy and treat the patient in a cur curable intent. And the patient's survival may be in years, like three, four years, if you have done a complete site rejection and intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So this is one of the another favorable situation you can have. The sixth situation is a mediastinal or peritoneal tumor. Where you have a you know, young adult, when you have a diagnosis of GCT in mind, it can be a primary GCT of the mediastinum or it may testicular tumor metastasis to the retroperitoneal mediastinum. So testicular ultrasound is a must. You have to do this tumor marker, LGH, beta, ACG, and other things. You can go for the ISC from this secondary. Suppose you have a supracavicular node in the setting of a, a young male with a retroperitoneal mass. So you can go ahead with the clap or SALL3. These are the tumor, uh, this IC markers for just uh, germ cell tumors. You can go ahead with PLAP or cell for CD30 glyping entry, or you can go ahead even with a fish for fluorescent situ hybridization for isochromosome 12p. This is the most common mutation which is associated with GCT. And you can establish your diagnosis from that if you, your biopsy is not conclusive. So, after this favorable, uh, this most more favorable cancer will come to diagnosis of some other cancer, like if you suspect a metastatic lung cancer in a setting of carcinoma of unknown primary, so you can go ahead with uh, this particular diagnosis of TTF1, napsin, that will lead to a diagnosis. And if it is a non small cell carcinoma, and if it is there is a mutation of the EGFR, ELK, or PDL1, this will help to have some targeted therapies like oral immunotherapies like risotinib <coughs> for you to uh, against this tumor. So, this can be allotinib. These are the drugs which can be used when this mutation comes positive. So, there is a still ray of hope that you can treat. To some extent, this metastatic lung tumors, if they are, these mutations are positive, like EGFR, ALK, ROS, 
and you can give some overall extra overall, overall survival possibly in years to this patient the last thing is the uh, if you are dealing with a colorectal metastasis if your diagnosis come to a colorectal ca from a suppose a omental or a peritoneal disease so you still have a scope of doing a cytoelectric surgery in these patients and you can add some targeted therapy if the keras is wild type so you can target with bevacizumab eh, sorry cetuximab or some in case of both for right and left colon you can target with the bevacizumab so these are the also targeted therapy which has come up in a colorectal ca so if, if you're dealing with a metastatic colorectal ca then the prognosis may be a little bit better than the other cancers so these are the usual situation or the favorable situation when it can be a good prognosis so if we revise this so first is a squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix and uh, this neck or supraclavical region with a non primary that is specifically uh, radio and amenability surgery and radiation so that can achieve a long term cure the squamous cell carcinoma of the inguinal node which may be associated with some occult malignancy of the vulva vagina can be also cured with the help of radiation if it is a neuroendocrine tumor we can target some uh, divide into low grade and high grade and accordingly we can treat this with the help of systemic therapies like somatostatin or some chemotherapies if the a diagnosis of a woman with a axillary breast cancer axillary uh, your uh, cervical neck node or a bone lung meds comes as a breast cancer and the, it is a good type of luminal a or luminal b type of growth cancer that is here here positive the patient may survive for 4 5 years on the this hormonal therapy or if it is a hard to new positive with the hard hard set kids if we can lead the diagnosis of a woman with a peritoneal and pelvic metastasis towards a ovarian cancer so that maybe there may be a chance to doing a complete cytorejective surgery and a intraperitoneal chemotherapy in this patients so that can achieve some long term long term cure other than this uh, your germ cell tumor if the, your diagnosis comes as a germ cell tumor in a metastatic setting so as you all know there is no stage 4 in the testicular cancer similarly germ cell because germ cell tumors are very chemosensitive so if your diagnosis is a metastatic germ cell tumor it's a blessing so you can treat the patient completely with the help of chemotherapy and patient can can be get cured and nowadays if the diagnosis non small cell lung cancer and the targeted mutations are positive so we can target this mutation with the help of systemic some immunotherapy that will help us to achieve some more long term cure also in colorectal ca the role of crs and some targeted therapy has come which has improved the overall survival so after that is a uh, another favorable point is if it is a single site of metastasis like oligometastasis if you call suppose if you are if you have a inguinal lymph node and your primary come out to be a uh, your lower rectum and it is the only site of metastasis then you can still try for a local regional therapy to the particular site or if it is a uh, suppose your esophageal cancer with a cervical neck node metastasis so still you can it can be a regional node in that particular cancers so if it is a single site or oligometastatic or if it is a breast cancer with a single bony mass or a single node in the opposite axilla so in that case you can still try for a curative inter treatment or a local regional therapy so in that cases also your prognosis can be good so these are the usual uh, favorable sites for metastasis of unknown primary uh, previously if we can't diagnose the primary site there is a empirical concept of empirical chemotherapy for uh, metastasis of unknown primary 
that they mostly a platinum based regime they will give to patients we you cannot diagnose but today it is not recommended in the era of molecular tumor profiling and with the help of updated IHC most of the time the diagnosis is being done and uh, obviously now in the age of targeted therapy after this you know, next generation sequence NGS panel so if you can target some particular mutation like if you have a VGF mutation or if you have a Keras mutation or EGFR mutation, you can give particular drug without being known about the what is the exact primary is. So this is called a targeted therapy. And uh, the last point what we'll, I will discuss is a prognostic factor in regards to uh, your metastasis. Metastasis is one known primary or carcinoma of unknown primary. So basically, uh, the prognosis it mostly depends on the patient performance status and comorbidity. So if the comorbidity or performance status is less than two, so usual prognosis is bad. If it is a liver metastasis, it is the usual prognosis is bad. If it is more than two metastatic site, inclined towards a bad prognosis, the low nutritional status of the patient, low albumin cachexia of the patient, as it is fatal demand that will incline that no, may not be further therapies will be possible. And a high LDH will uh, suggest that uh, there is a high tumor load is also a poor prognostic factor. So depending on this prognostic factor, the if the the survival varies from 2.4 months, which is very common for when one or more of this poor prognostic factor are present. And if no poor prognostic factors are present, the average survival for this good prognostic tumors is around 10.8 months. Still, with the help of uh, this immunotherapies, this advanced chemotherapy, if we don't have this particular favorable sites or favorable type of metastasis of unknown origin, in other cases, most of the cases, the survival is very bad. And most of the time, because of this patient's condition and exhaustive ex uh, and expensive investigation, we cannot actually land up in a particular diagnosis. And most of the time, the patient land up in a best supportive care without any particular, knowing the particular origin of cancer or the primary. And without knowing, doing any chemotherapy or any cancer-specific therapy to these patients. So with this, I want to conclude today's discussion. I think it is a very difficult topic, but uh, the idea is to let you understand that once you just deal with a metastatic disease, don't just leave your hopes. Try to find out the curable causes if it is a possibility. Try to find out the breast cancer, ovarian cancer, a neuroendocrine tumor, a head neck primary. And in that case, you can still salvage the patient. You can at least give the patient a survival in years, two, three, five years. And if you're lucky enough, you can have a very particular <clears throat> good diagnosis that can give a, actually cure the patient like in case of testicular tumor. So just having diagnosed a metastatic disease without any primary, just don't leave the patient on to go for the palliative care or try to diagnose the patient, try to know the primary and according to you can prognosticate and according to, accordingly you can plan your uh, treatment protocol, whether it is a palliative one or you can try with a curative intent. Having said that, you should always take the performance status, nutrition status or condition of the patient in mind. Even if the diagnosis is very good, like a germ cell tumor or breast cancer, if the Initial presentation, the patient performance status is very bad. Patient is already cancer that he has, they are nutritionally low. So most of the times, even after a cancer-oriented therapy or a curative therapy, patient will not respond that much. So diagnosis is important. Your approach is important to know the diagnosis. But side by side, you should keep the patient's condition, overall condition, general condition in mind to give the optimum amount of investigation advice because if you advise extensive investigation, a very poor performance status patient and a poor nutrition 
rehabilitated patient and you order extensive IHC and molecular profiling, other things, that will go in vain. That will not help the patient much because before doing all these things or getting the results of all these tests, he may or she may die. So it should be a judicial approach, balancing the diagnostic take to know the primary along with the patient's performance. So how much treatment he or she can take. So I think I have able to give some idea about this difficult topic. I'm free to any question you have.